Welcome to Chapter 24 of the Book of Deuteronomy, Social and Domestic Laws, more recapitulation of earlier laws that were given in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. It begins, and if any take a Geneka, a wife, the Gene in there, the Gina, gynecology, misogyny, I mentioned this so many times you're probably sick of hearing it, but somebody, people can just pick up at this place and not know what it means. Uh, so if any take a wife and should live with her, and it shall be, if she should find favor before him, I'm sorry, not find favor before him, for he finds in her an indecent thing, then he shall write to her a certificate of divorce scroll and shall put it into her hands and shall send her from out of his house. Now, we mentioned in the last chapter so that if this was... Um, a woman, that a man claiming that she was not a virgin, then they uh, keep the tokens of her virginity for the parents to bring in front of the judges and so forth. And this is a little bit different here. Now it goes in more of a divorce, uh, a legitimate divorce, not something somebody's trying to uh, use as far as the virginity issue. So uh, he shall write to her a certificate of divorce scroll. Now it has this asterisk uh, dagger actually because this is in Matthew 19 7. So we'll go there and it says, uh, And it came to pass when Jesus finished these words, he moved from Galilee and came unto the borders of Judea on the other side of the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him and he cured them there. And Pharisees came forward to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it allowed to a man to dismiss his wife for any reason? There's always the man doing it in the Old Testament. It's never the wife, as far as I see. And answering, he said to them, Jesus said to them, Did you not read that the one making from the beginning made them male and female? Uh, and he said, On account of this, a man shall leave the father and the mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two will be for one flesh. So bigamy is not counted. The two become one flesh. So that no longer are they two, but one flesh. And what then God yoked together, let not man separate, the imperative. So if God has yoke two people together, uh, then they should live until they one or the, both die or one or the other, and then they can remarry. Uh, I just received a pamphlet from my high school 60th reunion and all the different people in there and got to write things about themselves. And it was amazing how many people have been married for 50, 55 years, 53, uh, quite a few. Uh, it's wonderful. Not everybody has had a blessing of having a successful marriage like that. And continues, and they say to him, the Pharisees, Why then did Moses give charge to give a scroll of divorce and to dismiss her? Which is where we're at here uh, in the 24th chapter of Deuteronomy. He says to them that Moses, for the hardness of your heart, committed to your care to dismiss your wives. But from the beginning it happened not thus. And I say to you that everyone that whoever should dismiss his wife, not for harlotry, and should marry another, commits adultery, and the one being dismissed, marrying, commits adultery. And his disciples say to him, If thus is the fault of the man with the wife, it is not advantageous to marry. And he said to them, Not all have space for this word, but to the ones to whom it was given." So that's all about this place right here. We found Jesus in the first verse. And it continues in 2, And going forth, should she become to another man? Uh, I changed that a little bit. To another man. And the last husband should detest her, the last one that she's married to, and should write to her a certificate scroll of divorce and should put it into her hands and send her from out of his house, or 
her last husband should die, who took her to himself as a wife, the former husband sending her out shall not be able to return to take her to himself for a wife after being defiled, that is, by another man, for it is an abomination before the Lord your God. Now, why it's an abomination to God? He is the one that makes a decision of what is right or wrong. Now, is this true today? Well, that's an interesting uh, concept. I think it probably is. I think I don't see this as being any type of a um, Levitical law that Christ is nullifying. I think if it's something is an abomination to the Lord, I don't see where it would stop ever being an abomination to the Lord. And if it's an abomination to the Lord, well, you can decide uh, if you have a wife and you send her out, she to get divorced, she marries somebody else, and then she wants to come back, or you want her to come back, that's an abomination to the Lord. If you did it, well, then you're doing an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not defile the land which the Lord your God gives to you by lot. And if any should take a wife recently, he shall not go forth to war. Polemon. We have polemics comes from that. And not one thing shall be put upon him. Then nobody should give him a hard time because he's not going out to the war. He just got married. He shall be innocent in his house. For one year he shall make glad his wife whom he took. So if he gets married and there's a war breaks out, then for one, one year, uh, then he does not have to go to battle. Now, I don't know if that still counts in Israel or not with their uh, army. It probably does, but I'm not really sure. In the United States, as far as I know, it doesn't. But maybe it should. Uh, I had a half-brother who was born in about 1918, and my mother then had me in 1941. And my half-brother, uh, when he was... I don't know, 22 or 23, got married. Then, then the Second World War had broken out, broke out, and he was uh, called up, d drafted, and went to Germany and was killed in the Battle of the Bulge, uh, battle with under General George Patton. And he's buried in Lorraine, France, American Cemetery, and so. Maybe it was longer. I don't know exactly how long it took. But the wife was very broken up. He's really a good-looking man, and he's Italian. Uh, his father was Italian, and um, he he was very good-looking, and I'm sure she really loved him and then to have him die. She remarried later, I found out, fairly recently by looking things up on the Internet. Pretty amazing how you can do that. And I found a love poem that she wrote about him, and she got married the second time, and the second man, she had five children, and then he left them and moved away. Uh, so uh, I, was, uh, I was only able to contact her sister, who told me this story, and she had died about a year before I contacted her, and maybe that was six, seven years ago. But uh, it would be too bad. But because he was killed in the Battle of the Bulge, and my mother uh, was my, only, my mother's only surviving son. They have what's called the sole surviving uh, child shall not be deferred, the bloodline of the mother, which I was. So I was deferred from going to Vietnam. I couldn't go no matter what. Even if I wanted to join, I couldn't because it's the mother's uh, prerogative, and she was more than glad to do that. And then it continues in 6, you shall not take for security a millstone nor upper millstone. Now, basically, these are tools that you use to make money, to make a, have a livelihood. Uh, if you're a paper hanger, you have different types of uh, um, tools or a carpenter. And he's not listing them all out, but that's basically what it is. It says far... Uh, this one takes a life 
for security. If you take security from somebody of his tools, then how can he work to pay you back? Seven, and if you should capture a man stealing a life, I probably the the life or a life, and that would be putting a person uh, into slavery from out of his brothers, the Jews or the sons of Israel, and tyrannizing him to sell him, that thief shall die, uh, the person that put him into slavery, and you shall lift away the evil from out of yourselves of them. So that was a no, no. There's a part in the Bible that goes into this in the detail where the Jews quarrel over servitude in Nehemiah 5. And the cry of the people and their wives was great against their brothers of the Jews. And there were some saying, with our sons and with our daughters, we are many, and we shall take grain and we shall eat and shall live. Then there are some saying, our fields and our vineyards and our houses we mortgaged, and we shall take grain and we shall live. And there are some saying, we borrowed money for tribute of the king of our fields and our vineyards and our houses. Not, and now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers. And you can go in and read the whole thing about the slavery in Nehemiah. I'm just showing you that this was a problem going on, that the slavery uh, was even within uh, Israel. Verse 8, take heed to yourself in the infection of of leprous, leprosy. You shall guard exceedingly to do according to all the law, whichever the priests, the Levites, should announce to you, in which manner I gave charge to you, guard to do, in the imperative. Now, the only place that I can think of in the New Testament that leprosy was cured outside of here with Miriam, which God cleansed her, was the um, name and the Syrian general who came and uh, was was healed by, uh, I'm not sure if Elijah, Elisha, but he, uh, I think it was Elisha, and Gehazi was his second, his helper, uh, not, it was Elisha's helper, I think it was Elisha. So, um, the only other places in the New Testament where Jesus healed the lepers. And so we can uh, go in to that, find out what uh, this is all about. It says, And it came to pass in his going unto Jerusalem, and he went through the midst of Samaria and Galilee up the north. And of his entering into a certain town, there met with him ten leprous men who stood at a distance, they had to stand at a distance and yell out, leprosy, unclean, unclean, that's what it was, and had to be all covered, looked disheveled, uh, and had their face covered, and there's laws of the lepers, lepers, which we've went through already, but uh, this here is of the cleansing, not the problem of the leper. And they lifted their voice, saying, Jesus, Master, show mercy on us. And beholding, he said to them, having gone, Display yourselves to the priests. So, and it came to pass, in their going away, they were cleansed. And one from out of them, beholding that he was healed, returned with a great voice, glorifying God, and fell upon his face by his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. And responding, Jesus said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not found any returning to give glory to God except this foreigner? So the others, now it doesn't say whether they went in to the, show the, uh, the um, priests that they were cleansed and give the uh, offerings. It just brings out here that the Samaritan, who probably didn't go in because they wouldn't have let him, came back after maybe on the way Somewhere along the way, halfway, they all got were cleansed, and the nine kept on going to hopefully go tell the priest. And But the Samaritan came back, and apparently none of the other nine ever did. Uh, and he said—I'm uh, sorry, we'll go back now to the um, 
I get all excited getting into the New Testament when I teach that. <laughs> Remember as much as the Lord your God did to Miriam in the way of your going forth from out of Egypt, where her and Aaron came against Moses, and the Lord turned Miriam into a leper for a certain period of time as they, he cried out to God. And so, uh, and if a debt uh, might be owed by your neighbor, any debt whatsoever, you shall not enter into his house to take for security of his item for security. So if he had a um, chair worth $100, and you got a, went to the neighbor and said, I'll, I'll give you my, put my chair up for security if I can't pay you, then um, our clothes would maybe be even better. Uh, maybe it was a, a coat for the night in cold weather. And so um, the neighbor had um, given him the money and has the security of this coat. But it says, uh, you shall stand outside, and the man of whom your loan is by, by, he shall bring forth to you the item of security outside. So therefore, you're not to go inside of the person's house and grab it and just take it. That can turn into a real nasty thing. Uh, I have a friends uh, that something like that happened, that somebody had an uh, item of security, well, he had something, and they went to get it, and the person came outside and started fighting and, um, and ended up having a heart attack and died, and the other two were, con were uh, charged with murder, in which they uh, were let off. Uh, by a light sentence of manslaughter, but uh, it's not a good idea to go into somebody's house to get it. And here they were prohibited from doing that. But if the man should be in need, you shall not go to bed in his item of security. So let's say you had a, uh, you took his bedding and he didn't have a bed, uh, didn't have anything to cover himself up and it was cold, then. Um, he would be freezing. But by restitution, you shall give back to him his item of security towards the descent of the sun at the evening, and he shall go to bed in his garment, and he will bless you. So we have these um, things that uh, God is giving instructions on social welfare. And it will be to you for charity before the Lord your God, so you don't go after it and let the man have it and keep it. You shall not disregard the wage of the needy, and one lacking from out of your brothers or from out of the foreigners in your cities. Daily you shall give him his wage. Well, that's really wonderful. Um, I think we should do that in the United States. Somebody works... Uh, so many hours a day, then they get the, either the money or they get points. Electronic um, goes into your account by the day, and no and no income tax. You just get your wage uh, because you've worked, and the income tax should come from other places. And so there's no withholding. There's no IRS. Uh, just no filling out forms by the employer uh, for the things that. Um, taxes to take out of his wage. Very, very simple. I don't know why it's not done today that way. It says, uh, the sun shall not set upon him. So you pay him right away, for he is needy, and in it he has hope. And thus he shall now yell out against you to the Lord, and it will be to you a sin. And a lot of times, very wealthy people can take advantage of the poor because the poor person needs the money, and they know that, and they have them under they have them underneath their thumb and just can squeeze them and make life miserable. It happened to me years ago when I had a business uh, sale and canvas cleaning, and I got a sale from a boat that was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Big, huge sale. Took me a long time, cleaned it, brought it back. It was couple hundred dollars to clean it. And the man found, you know, some little thing so he couldn't, and he's going all over looking to find things fault with it so he wouldn't have to pay me. And uh, this is what it's kind of talking about. Don't do that. 
And then it says, Fathers shall not die for the children, and the sons shall not die for the fathers. Each in his own sin shall die. So you, whoever you are, you're responsible for your own sin. Now, a father of the parents can be liable for minor children. If they did something wrong, then the parents can uh, have to pay up and um, pay money in the United States if they find that the person, the parents were um, negligent, then they could be charged with a crime. Uh, but if you had an unruly child, then you can make them a, uh, uh, what's it called, a servant, um, uh, it's, it's a freedom that the child, if he's under 18, 16, um, not an emancipated minor, and then uh, it's a, you go to the judge and say he's gone his own, does his own thing, doesn't live with me anymore. So you can get a judgment against him as far as he's, anything he does, uh, he's responsible for it, and not you. You don't lose your house if he's done something. Now, the emancipated minor, that's up to the judge. You shall not turn aside a judgment of a proselito, a foreigner, a proselyte, and an orphanu, orphan, transliterations, and a widow. And you shall not take for security a garment of a widow. So you can't take anything from a widow uh, for security. And you shall remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God ransomed you from there. On account of this, I give charge to you to do this thing. And if you should reap your harvest in your field, and you should forget a sheaf in your field, you shall not turn back to take it. To the poor and to the foreigner and to the orphan and to the widow, it will be. That is the gleaners. And I'm not sure if they still have gleaning laws or not in the States. Probably do, but I don't know where it would be. Then that that the Lord your God should bless you by letting the gleaners go in, in every work of your hands. And if one should pick olives, you shall not turn back to glean after you. It shall be to the foreigner and to the orphan and to the widow. And whenever you should gather the vintage of your vineyard, you shall not glean the things after you. It will be to the foreigner and the orphan to the orphan and to the widow. You shall remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt. On account of this, I give charge to you to do this thing. Next chapter, social and marital laws. We'll find out more about this as we continue with these laws that we have heard before and goes into a little bit more detail detail in the Deuterocanon, uh, uh, Deutero, the second law, De Deuteronomy, Deuteronomos. And so in the next uh, video, chapter 25, hope you'll join us. God bless.